Hi, I'm Calvin Milan, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. Happy here with us, thank you for joining. As always, I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaugh, and today is always our co-host, Chris Bixby and Matt Bingo. How are you guys doing? Yes. Doing terrific. Doing Hello everyone, how are you? Jake, how you doing, man? You're doing great, Matt, thank you for asking. Fantastic. Who do we have today? Well, today's guest we have for today, she's a puppeteer. A lot of you may know her puppetry work for being involved in lots of projects for Jim Henson Company that we will touch base on later, including a set of science kits, plush and bubbles, pajamas, and of course, many others. And uh, of course, she's now the current performer of Moki Frogo. Please welcome Don Kimball. How about you here, Don? Hello, hello. Hi, friends. Hi. Hello. Happy to have you here. How are you? I'm delighted to be here. Thanks. It's a uh, it's a new year. Yep. Mm-hmm. Kicked it off to a good start, haven't we? Ish ish. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Good start. Good start. Absolutely. Yes. Good to have you here. So um, to kick things off, really um, so um, we know who you are, but for those who haven't, uh, could you tell our audience a bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. I uh, have been a puppeteer for about I just did the math. 30 years this year, I did my first show. So um, yeah, working mostly for the Jim Henson Company, also for Sid and Marty Croft and some other things. Um, Yeah, and I took over for uh, Kathy Mullen on the role of Moki Fraggle on Fraggle Rock and took over for Billy Whitelaw, um, the role of Agra on Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, the Netflix show. And um, I also did the voice of Freddie the Flute on the show button stuff so sort of took over that role uh as well so um so yeah just a working working puppeteer man <laughs> nice oh, boy. happy 30th anniversary by the way thank you yes yes, yes. absolutely so kind of before getting into puppetry could you talk about like what your childhood was like like were you always into puppetry you know kind of yeah um huge jim henson fan as a kid Like I remember um, I had the audio recording on an LP of the Muppet Musicians of Bremen and Frog Prince and um, all of those. Um, So my mom knew early on that uh, I was super, super into puppets um, and pretty much everything Jim Henson and Sesame Street, of course. And uh, my brother and I would um, get puppets when we could. I remember I had one of those Ernie sort of hard rubber puppets I got for Christmas. There's a picture of me posing with Ernie and I got a cookie monster and it ha- he actually had a hole in the back of his mouth so you could like shove cookies in there and, and they would disappear. So great. Um, so I loved uh, puppet stuff and uh, my brother and I would put on shows just listening to like funny songs and we would act them out with puppets and build like costumes and scenery and stuff. Nice. Interesting. So what made you want to get into puppetry as a career? You know, I didn't even really think that I could do it as a career for like the longest time. Um, I got into acting and was a theater major at University of Memphis. And um, I remember one acting class, we had a talent show, bring in some talent. And so I brought my puppet in and, you know, puppeteered a little bit. Uh, but I didn't really think it was a thing. And then I did um, I did the musical Nonsense and I played Sister Marionette where she does a duet with a puppet. And um, I got a lot of good feedback on that because I knew how to puppeteer like a lot of actresses did not. And so um, that kind of got my wheels turning. Huh, maybe I could do something like this maybe. And um, I was doing a musical with my friend Paul Lewis and he, um, said we both talked about our how much we love Jim Henson and he said if I built some puppets would you want to do shows at malls and schools and stuff and I was like sure supplement my starving actor income heck yeah so uh 
And then he sold one to a local producer just when I had moved out here. So I went back to South Florida to do that. Uh, and that was Jelly Bean Jungle, which was a syndicated show. But that was my first show. It's Amy Garcia's first show. Um, Brad Abel's first show. So oh, a lot yeah, of Brad. people got their start. Yeah. Oh, Brad's yeah, Brad's great. great. He's also a previous guest. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so... Uh, one of your other earlier puppetry projects was kind of assisting on the sitcom Greg the Bunny. Uh, what was it like working on that? <laughs> that was great. That's when I first met uh, Mike Mitchell, Dan Milano, um, a bunch of other folks. Uh, that was really fun. It was it was interesting to be on a big show like that, you know, a big sitcom for television. Uh, Eugene Levy was there, such a nice guy. Uh, Sarah Silverman. Just, it was a really fun, big kind of show. Um, yeah, it was a blast. I mostly did Hands for Count Blah, uh, and then the occasional like background character and stuff. Uh, that was just really fun. We were hoping for uh, a second season for that, but it didn't happen. But um, man, I loved Warren the Ape. I thought he was just the funniest flipping <laughs> character. And getting to know Dan was uh, was such a treat. And of course, Mike Mitchell. So nice it was a blast. <laughs> Mm. Nice. So over the years, you've had the pleasure of working on many projects with the Jim Hunter Company, the first being Sid the Science Kid as teacher Susie and Zeke. What was that show like and kind of with the Henson digital performance system? Because I know you worked a lot with that on Sid the Science Kid as well. Yeah, um, that yeah, that was my first show with Henson. I had um, gotten in and trained a little bit on the system before and had done a similar type system with another company for a, a live show. So I kind of knew my way up around it a little bit. Um, so yeah, that was probably the most prepared audition I've ever had where I really, I worked with someone, I coached with someone to just be as, as prepared as I could be. Cause I had had a few auditions for the company before and had never sort of broken through. And I thought, oh, got this audition. I was like, oh, I was like, no, no, I'm not gonna talk myself down. I'm gonna be as prepared as I can. I'm gonna over prepare, but still be flexible. And I'm gonna, my goal is a callback. And uh, I got my callback and then I got hired and I, it, was, it, was, it was great, but it was really, I really kind of set a goal for myself and a real intention for myself that you know, this time is gonna be different. This time I'm really gonna break through somehow. And I think I was just ready. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Pre it, mm -hmm. They say it, what um, luck meets preparedness. Right, yeah. Or mm -hmm. opportunity, or luck equals opportunity meets preparedness, something like that. That's what yeah. it felt like. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. and one of those. This is actually kind of an interesting question. So I know, because I know, of course, um, with Sid the Science Kid, uh, Miss Susie got to sing a lot on the show. What do you have any favorite uh, songs that uh, Teacher Susie got to sing? Well, there are so many. We did sixty-seven songs right, over yeah. the two seasons. That was crazy. Mm -hmm. um, that was a, such a treat because the the Henson Studios is the former A and M Studios. So mm -hmm. the Rolling Stones have recorded there. That's where they did um, the We Are the World video was recorded in there. So it's such history. I mean, the whole the whole lot has a ton of history. So to have to finish my shoot day early and scoot on in there and and just sing songs was great. Um, oh gosh, so many because there were pretty much every possible musical style you could think of. Oh, I love the Inertia song. I mean, how many yeah. people get to sing a song oh, yeah. about Inertia, right? Right, yeah, that's a good yes. one. Um, that one was uh, the Katrina in the Waves style. That one always reminded me of um, yeah, of, uh, Walking on Sunshine. Yeah, and of course the uh, the sticker chart song is a classic. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. checking yes. out charts. Um, yes, yes. Uh, move that body. Yeah, also a good one. Um, so many, my, right? My best guess, mm -hmm. the drawing up the germ. I mean, there's so many. Yeah, there's <laughs> so many good, so many good ones. ones. Yes, such, such a wonderful mm -hmm. show. I agree. So mm -hmm. fun. Yes. Um, so now uh, another show you worked on, which used the Henson Digital Performance System, was uh, Splash and Bubbles. Can you talk a bit about working on that? Oh, yeah. That was a blast. Oh, look, I'm surrounded by swag. I just noticed. <laughs> hey, not that I'm promoting anything or anything. Um, <laughs> Word Party started, um, so it was Word Party before Splash and Bubbles, but um, all, all great. By the time Splash and Bubbles came around, I was kind of an elder 
So I was able to teach some other people and train up some other people, myself and Alan Troutman, to uh, who were just learning HDPS and give them some some tricks and and things like that. So um, new characters were popping up all the time. So I got really fast at programming a character. So the HDPS, as I think you know, is there's a Waldo on one side, a joystick on the other, and so yeah. many different controls uh, that all your fingers can do. The direction of the um, the Waldo and the stick also are different controls. We have foot pedals, but the puppeteers are the animators also. So we build those expressions as well and adjust them on the fly. And so sometimes if you, you know, the director says, you know, can you wink at this character at the end of the scene? You say, sure. Oh shoot, I didn't build a wink yet. So you have to go in there and create this new expression and assign it to some control because it's all customizable. And then, um, yeah, and then think about, it. it's not just the eye closing, but you know the lids around it sort of close. The cheek comes up a little bit. You know, and this this eye may do something. You know, as a sympathetic movement. So uh, it's really involved, and I kind of love it. Once I once I figured it out, Leslie Carrara said, you know, when you when you're learning HTPS for the first three weeks, you cry, and then after that, <laughs> it starts to like land because it's a lot. It's a lot of info, but it's very uh, it's very it's very fun. Absolutely. And uh, what was it like puppeteering uh, Sweet Pea Sue and Bedtime Bunny on Pajanimals? Oh, wow. That was really fun. I wasn't supposed to play Bedtime Bunny. That was a last minute change. Um, so I came up with this idea of her falling asleep. Um, well, it was written that she would fall asleep, but I just wanted it to be a bit more dynamic and funny. So I, I wanted her to, you know, have her eyes widen and go into sort of a shock and then fall over and then feathers fly up. Oh, all that was, all that was my idea. So some, some poor person with feathers had to go and blow up feathers every time my feather would fall down. But it made it, made the joke. Um, that was really fun. Granny Pearl uh, was fun on that show. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, I just want to point out before all that happened, I worked on uh, Spider-Man 2, where I was the uh, one of the claws yeah. of Dr. Octopus. Oh, right. Nice. That was oh. pretty fun. That was a very long job. That was about a year. Um, and Brad Abril was on that show as well. Um, uh, Greg Ballora, also Ron, Rob Saunders. A uh, lot of, I was the only woman. There were 16 total, but uh, and working with Alfred Molina was great, but figuring out the language of the movement of those tentacles was uh, was a big challenge. And articulating all the, because all the, the claw would articulate. So we had different controls that did different things. So we would do like a, at this pose and at this pose and at this pose and at, you know, this pose, just all different kinds of, we sort of created a catalog of, of positions and movements and what they meant. And, all that stuff that was a cool job that was i haven't done a whole lot of special effects puppetry but um that was one but in in the end they're they're really all the same you're taking a inanimate character and giving it thoughts and feelings and you know wants and all of that so yeah i loved sweet pea sue i loved making her just weirder and and weirder because cal bella was like the girly girl and they wanted um, Sweet Pea Sue to be the more nurturing type. And I thought, mm, that's kind of boring. Let me see what else I can do. So I just started making her <laughs> funny and weird and quirky. And that they really, um, the producers really responded to that and, and encouraged me further in that direction. So that was really fun. Like, so having uh, Sweet Pea Sue be an alien for Halloween was uh oh, yeah that was my idea because my daughter was an alien when she was a uh, a kid for halloween she wasn't into girly oh. girl stuff either so oh, hmm. yeah yes and um there are lots of great episodes and of course songs um uh some of them including uh, the happy birthday sweet pea sue yes that's um, a great one uh, I, I was I, just I watching it this dad. morning um of course an octopus hug and uh, yeah, Blanky in the Laundry. So many, of course, so many great Of course, some of the songs that Sweet, Sweet Pea Sue got saying, like, Stick to the Plan. Stick and to the Plan. Bunny, and uh, the, um, the, the, the Quiet Song. And uh, the the Friend Song. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. really wonderful. Right. I think Stick to the Plan, to me, is classic. And, of course, the Lullaby Song. That was really Yes, nice. yes. yes. I love that uh, so yes. much. So great. Yeah, it was lovely. Yeah, I got to voice mm -hmm. Mom also in that, so I... 
Yeah, yeah. I know. That's that's right. Right. Ah. Yeah. No, yeah, that was lovely. Yeah, that lullaby song is just classic. Absolutely. So, um, is it fine if we can hear a little bit of uh, Sweet Pea Sue? Uh, sure. You know what's funny is that I have a, uh, I have a little Sweet Pea Sue under my tree, under my Christmas tree, because a lot of the plushy toys of characters that I've had, I don't leave them sitting out. I put them in the Christmas box so they come out and sit under the tree. So yeah, I should stick to the plan. Stick to the plan. <laughs> <laughs> always takes a minute oh man i love that show so much that was so fun yes. we shot that yes. in belfast belfast northern ireland belfast wow yeah. nice that was cool wow that's, Absolutely. that's really cool so you also got to work as you had mentioned earlier on the dark crystal age of resistance voicing uh agra what was it like working on that show it was awesome. You know, because I did ADR, I wasn't on the shoot, but I did go visit for a week um, and visited the sets, which were amazing. Uh, so detailed, so lush. Um, they had, at the time that I was visiting, they had um, Rianne running through the woods and going into the, the gobbles, you know, the gobbles section where mm -hmm. um, one of the mm -hmm. characters like ends up dying. I forget which one. Oh, gosh. Sorry, uh, but uh, that was amazing because they had all these puppeteers under there wiggling this carpet of, you know, black blobs and stuff. And um, scenes in the tavern, I was, I got to see and stone, the stone in the wood village just walking through that was just really amazing. Beautiful, beautiful sets and uh, watching Louis Leterrier in action uh, was, was remarkable because he, you know, operated the camera himself. Um, up on his shoulder and steady cam too. Uh, really something. But by the time I got around to ADR, well, I was actually a little more dialed into production than a lot of the other actors because mm -hmm. I provided scratch track for Kevin Clash to perform with on the day, rhythms and stuff. And then when they would shoot, they would record him as a scratch for me to do in the final um, looping sessions. So that was pretty neat. Um, yeah, it's a, it was a tough voice to do, as you can imagine. Um, and there she is right there. There's, there's Augur right there. Oh, nice. uh, 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 hard on your, on your throat to do that voice. So I'd have my big old cup of throat coat tea and just keep drinking the tea um, and then just rest for a, a day after. But a lot of good rest and I was fine for the next time. But I think there was one scene where I nearly like I got really lightheaded and had to sit down. Oh, I think it was the dying scene <laughs> when, when Agra's like mm. dying. I had to like have a chair behind me, like, yeah, chair. I'm like, you know, probably not a bad idea because there was just so much screaming and, um, you know, dying. It was very emotional, really, to, you know, there's this character that I love, that we all love, and she's, you know, sacrificing herself for these other characters that she loves. And it was, it was quite a, um, emotional so uh, that one just blew my mind because i love dark crystal so much the original film when it came out and to get to do her was such a surprise and um really really something just such an honor really an honor of course definitely so uh you were also one of many puppeteers on the uh, disney plus series earth to ned where you got to assist on the character ned uh what was it like working on that uh that was hilarious because ned's desk right we called it the pit and then we started calling it the glitter pit um because ned's costume looked you know like an old elvis costume but it would rain this super fine gold glitter on it so we were covered and we for months we would find glitter in places that we didn't even know we had places um but yeah we would just be covered in glitter so we called the glitter pit and then i then we started calling ourselves the glitter pitters so those of us who did hands, so there are always three of us in there. So I did both of Ned's hands, um, the, the two center hands, and then there'd be another puppeteer on the far right hand and the far left, usually Raymond Carr and Greg Ballora, and then Morgana Ignis inside um, in a special pilot seat, driving the body around. And then Paul Rugg doing the voice was over on the other side assisted by Alan Trout. So there's six puppeteers on Ned all the time. Wow. Uh, yeah, Alan would do like his little hackles that would stand up. And I think mm -hmm. maybe his eyes, 
and then Paul just Paul did mouth, and I think Alan did everything else on the face. Nice. So the times that the clods were in next to Ned, there would be like ten people shoved in this tiny, like a closet. Like imagine ten people in your closet. That's really what it felt like. It was like, can I just get my like? Okay, I just have to. Or I just have to put my arm down. Can you just step over? Just inhale, inhale, so I can get my arm down. Um, yeah, hilarious. It was so like. <laughs> Uh, smoosh but really fun really great to to hang out with all these celebrities seeing the celebrities reaction when the first time they saw ned was always hilarious because our our we were instructed to always have ned up and alive when the celebrity was brought in so that they were, they were in a state of wonder and awe that they'd slap a mic on him sit him down and we just start right away and that was brian's idea he just i want to keep them in that state of holy crap before uh <laughs> <laughs> before starting which I think really helped. Um, so uh, that was that show was a blast. The fact that it was improvised pretty much throughout was uh, was a trip. And following someone as wild as Paul Rugg is, uh, and sometimes we got it and sometimes we didn't, because we're all having to listen to each other too. Because Morgana's in the body driving it around, and I'm doing the hands. And, uh, so yeah, just all of us working together uh, it was challenging, but really fun nice hmm. interesting so you also voiced franny the cheetah in jim henson's word party <laughs> nice n yes there you go nice segue for the mug <laughs> could you uh could you talk a bit about uh word party yeah i was i was actually attached to that project pretty early on it originally the uh title was chatter zoo and then it hmm. became a uh, word party and the look of franny changed quite a bit she um she turned more into a kitten sort of shape which i i think was a smart move because they would test with with kids and ask what kind of animal franny was and they couldn't quite tell she's a mommy she's a panda she's a what so um so the look of franny changed over time which was a good thing uh really fun again i I got to play the the non girly girl character, which uh, I really enjoyed doing because um, I just find it a little more freeing. I love that Franny has a temper, gets mad, that she you know loves to run really fast, that she's super fast. Because then a lot of uh, a lot of little boys loved Franny, and for a lot of boys, Franny was their favorite character. So uh, yeah, I I love. Uh, I love my cheetah and I got to work with John Cameron was the body of Franny and he and I just we just adore each other and I love working with John he's he's so talented and he can do anything and um yeah that was a blast that show we all just had a really really good time nice so now um uh, you got to work on a few Sid and Mario crop projects including Mun stuff and Sigmund and the sea monsters what was it kind of like getting to work on those Oh, you know, uh, really interesting and very different. Mutton stuff was was great. I just played, you know, Zoe up in the trees. So I would come in and do like one day every two weeks and do three or six episodes like all at once. And then I would go and do something else. So uh, yeah, it was really interesting for me um, in that way because I wasn't there necessarily all day, every day. But still, um, the set is, was so much of a family and it was wonderful working with Marty Croft. He was there every day because uh, he was just the kind of producer that, you know, showed up every day. Um, lovely. He, Marty was always wonderful to me. Uh, Bradley Zweig was the showrunner and he was also our showrunner on Sid the Science Kid. So we knew each nice. other. Um, so it was just really, really fun that show and working with all the dogs was great on mutton stuff and then uh sigmund and the sea monsters was different it's a much shorter shoot but also the um controls we had were were different with it was all remote control so we're doing the little game controllers to operate the face and then lexi pearl was the body of, of sweet mama uh, and i loved working with with lexi and a lot of the same, you know, guys worked with Victor and Drew that I'd worked with on Nut and Stuff. And oh, Michael, they're wonderful. Yeah, yes. and Michael Ostrom joined us for, for Sigmund, too. 
uh, so yeah, just a real, a real blast. I really enjoyed going there. The funniest thing was we shot, it, it was the exterior of uh, Dunder Mifflin from the office. So mm -hmm. there are always people outside the gate taking photos of the building, <laughs> office fans, you know, fans of the office, mm -hmm. uh, taking photos of the parking lot and stuff. I was like, okay, this is a famous building exterior here in Panorama City. <laughs> so funny, huh? Yes, and um, very recent, very recently, we sadly lost uh, Marty Croft. Um, I was wondering, can you share like any uh, stories or memories you can share from uh, getting to know him? Yeah, we so I did Mutton Stuffs and Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, and then two pilots. We did a pilot of Bugaloo's and a pilot of um, my Embiolic pilot, Science Pilot. Neither of those uh, sold, but. Um, really fun to work with all of those um when um puff and stuff came back with cling and clang and freddy the flute um they had wanted me to basically audition for the role of uh freddy the flute and so it was you know wow because i love freddy the flute when i was a kid you know and i was so uh excited and nervous so i worked on the voice that pulled up some old um old episodes on youtube and i'm rehearsing in the stairwell so okay marty wants to see you now okay great so i go in there and go okay here's what i got and so i have the puppet of freddie the flute and i'm doing the voice he's like okay all right yeah you got the job kid like yeah whoa <laughs> so i went to a room and took a photo of me and myself with freddie the flute and uh i just got the part of freddie the flute I was already on. I was already doing Zoe on uh, on Mutton Stuff, but it was such a treat to be able to do Freddie the Flute's voice. And then I puppeteered the face on Puff and Stuff. That was also great because I love Puff and Stuff. Absolutely. I had a toy Puff and Stuff. Oh, nice. Mm. Nice. nice. Wonderful to hear. So uh, now uh, you're also a puppeteer of the revival of Crank Yankers. Uh, can you talk a bit about working on that? That was fun. I worked on the original as well um in 20 years ago 20 20-ish years ago yeah uh really fun the first time i did it in the the first go around i think i just did like assisting and background characters and stuff but this time around i did um uh more calls and stuff so it's a lot of homework listening to the call and you know knowing what's coming and working out what you want to do in your head and then being open to what the director tells you. Um, yeah, that was a blast. Um, John Kimmel's really fun. Uh, the other puppeteers were fun. There were, you know, some that were regulars. And so uh, I was a day player, but I was on quite frequently. Uh, really fun. A lot of the same, interestingly, some of the same crew that we had on other shows, like the same audio crew from uh, Word Party and Mutton Stuff, interestingly. So, nice. uh, yeah, you just kind of never knew what you were going to do that day. You just sort of walk in and see what's on the list and go, I could be anything. I could be the the cheese in the corner, or I could be assisting this person doing this big call. I don't know. So that was kind of fun. So in, in film, you've puppeteered several characters in the movie The Happy Time Murders. Very interesting film, I might add. Uh, could you kind of talk about working on that? Yes, that was a, a delight. I uh, it was always great to to work with so many puppeteers um, on the big days. I think I filmed. There was one time we all got together for a photo, and I just went around and, and filmed everyone saying hi. And I think there were like twenty three of us there that day, or something. So uh, it was really it was a blast. I love. I always love working with Kevin. He um, I felt like always gave me something interesting to do that day. Uh, yeah, you know, it's always do interesting doing the adult stuff because that's it's kind of a definitely a lower percentage of what you, we do as puppeteers. Most of what we do is for kids, family, but the occasional crank anchors are happy time murders. You know, it's also fun, pup it up, um, puppeteering for a different uh, audience. Oh yeah, I love uh, pup it up. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's wonderful, but really i i mostly remember working with the people that uh 
on that show. And some days we shot outside and it was blazing hot because we were up in Santa Clarita in the summertime. So uh, we were shooting the funeral scene, I think. That was like 100 degrees and we were all pretty sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Papa Love is so, so wonderful. Um, <laughs> so now uh, you're also a part of of a short-lived game show network series, Way to Night Liars, performing Shelley Oceans. What's it like getting into performing her? That was a really tough puppet. Really heavy and really tough mouth because she's latex that's been flocked. So it just didn't have a whole lot of movement. And it just took a lot of force to get the mouth open. So that was a bit of a challenge. I had a pretty sore forearm uh, all during that show. Uh -huh. But also very interesting because it was it was kind of scripted and kind of not so really loose with the with the improv um that's where i got to work a lot with colleen smith again in sort of that loose improv -y style uh you know tyler bunch brian clark really um the, the four of us you know buried in there but the live audience aspect was was very interesting and very new for uh for me and seeing you know seeing the first AD wrangle the crowd saying, okay, guys, keep your energy up because they'd be sitting there for hours, you know, but, uh, and having like standards and practices, you know, game show people who make sure that everything is running properly and legally that that whole aspect was, uh, was new, but, uh, yeah. Fun. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. So, um, for the past uh, couple of years now, you've inherited the role of a uh, Moki Fraggle, as we talked about earlier and, a lot of recent Fraggle Rock projects. Uh, what went into kind of uh, auditioning for Moki and getting that character? You know, I actually didn't audition for her formally. I um, The first thing I did was the Ben Folds 5 video. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was really fun. And Karen uh, was there. So that was good. And Karen was giving us pointers, but... Um, uh yeah lisa just asked me to to do that and i i did that one it was delightful and you know karen pointing out things like you know she's a little more fluid in her movements like okay great good note good note um and then the second one was the um the puppets for puppetry benefit on stage at henson which i think that one was for dave goals yeah and so i had a couple of lines as moki so that's when I did her voice for the first time. Um, and we sang Follow Me. And then, and that was Johnny doing Gobo. Kevin doing oh, Wembley. Johnny, he's wonderful. He's so yeah. Well, I was gonna Lovely. Do and then Karen doing Red. So, so that was the first time I spoke as Moki. And then, um, and then the Fraggle Rock, Rock On shorts. And that's when the, the series talk was, was happening. So yeah, that just sort of that just sort of happened. But uh, to have the original Moki puppet, there she is. Um, <laughs> to have her here in my house was just like wow. Moki's in, Moki's visiting me during the pandemic. She's the only human visitors can't come visit, but but Moki can. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, that was crazy because they would just drop off everything. And so we built built it up ourselves, put up the blue screen and the camera and threw some lights on and the audio and making sure the puppet's working and wrangling. I think I needed extra rods. So I had to like literally pull coat hangers out of my closet and because there's no one to come help because it was right when everything was locking down. So uh, my daughter was home from college and she was assisting me on some things. So doing all those yoga poses uh, was a crazy, uh, crazy time. So doing that and then hearing that the series got picked up and they wanted me to continue on the series was just, it was like Christmas, you know? It's just, again, such an honor to be entrusted with a, a, such a beloved character. Absolutely, incredible show. Yeah, glad, glad, uh that there's you know actually because you mentioned doing the shorts and now it came back as an official series which yeah. i know mentioning john tertaglia he was very instrumental in kind of writing and working behind the scenes on that too in addition to performing gobo so what's it what's it like getting to work on back to the rock 
Um, that, I think that was my, that has been my favorite uh, job ever. Um, having someone like Johnny uh, as our fearless leader, because he was not only puppet captain, but he's executive producer. So he kind of, he kind of pretty much ran everything. I mean, he was in charge of, of you know, creatively, because he was our person who was just always there because other producers would come, you know, in and out. Um, but he was our one creative producer who was always there. So he was the one who kind of, every puppeteer who had a question, we, we would all go to Johnny. And yes, there was a co-captain both seasons, Frank Meshkalite the first season and Amy Garcia the second season. Um, so big group scenes and big choreographed scenes, you know, we would, but I, I don't know how he, I don't know how he did it all overseeing, but, and I would check in with him sometimes, like, are, are you, you doing okay? You doing okay? He's like, oh, are you kidding? I'm, I'm living my eighth grade dream right now, working on Fraggle Rock. And, um, so, uh, it was, it was fantastic. A real, so many puppeteers, so many wonderful new best friends. And we have a, um, a social media, you know, private chat where we check in with each other all the time. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. A real family. Yeah. Yes. Really, really a family. Yes. I, I really hope we get a third season and hopefully we won't have to have masks on because, um, because I, a lot of these people, I'm going to have to relearn names and stuff, seeing their whole, uh, seeing their whole faces. But yeah, we were wearing, you know, can 95 masks all day, every day. And unless we had dialogue, then we would drop them and then put them back up once we cut. So dealing with COVID during that was, was interesting, but just a wonderful job. I'm so excited for season two. Yes, yes. that's right. We, yes, can, we, can, we, we can talk Excited about that now. Much. And for those who are uh, yes. watching or listening who don't know, um, the d premiere date for season two was just announced. It'll be out on uh, March 29th. Yay. Really? Yes. yes. It, was, it was just announced today. Yes. 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 As it is being recorded, for those who don't know. Yes. Uh, March, yeah, March 29th. I'm so happy. Yes, I heard it was going to be late March. That's all I knew. Yeah. So, um, yeah. oh, that's wonderful. Definitely. So forward, yes. Oh, so are we. Yeah, so so Let the countdown yes. begin. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Let the countdown begin, indeed. Uh, yeah, we're we're really excited about the second season. Um, yeah, it was it was just announced, like I think earlier this morning. Um, I think. Yeah. And, Fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's, oh, it's I'm amazing. So excited to hear that. Uh, um, so. Yeah, it was great to play. Um, storyteller days were always super fun. Um, you know, Moki, wonderful. I had a designated assistant, Kira Hall, who's a brilliant puppeteer in their own right um, from Toronto. Uh, just a lot of, so much talent on that set. It was really, really uh, something. And I yes. think, of course, I can't give anything away for season two, but um, just more fun, more more silly storyteller moments, really great songs, amazing. Uh, well, you know, some of the voices that, that we've got this time, some of the, the actors that we have. Yeah. Um, just, it's, yeah. it's gonna blow your mind. Yes. Very looking forward to it. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. So uh, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Fraggle fans are wondering, is, if, is it fine if we hear a bit of Moki? Oh, sure. I think she's a little closer to my, uh, you know, to my heart. Well, just, she's the one I've done most recently. So, you know, I really like the, I really like the way that Moki kind of describes meditation to children, you know? Matt, I see you closing your eyes so, so you can visualize Moki. That's right, with you. I think he's getting a little bit really emotional. Oh, are you? Oh, okay. Yes, and I'm, 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 yes, That's I am okay. kind let of getting go. emotional. Just, just, yeah. yeah, let it go. That's fine. <sighs> Because something yep. similar happened when we interviewed uh, Johnny, and he did a uh, Gobo's voice. <laughs> Been a Fraggle fan since I was eight years old. That's a dream come uh, true right there. Oh, uh, that's lovely. <laughs> well, to be to be in charge, to be the 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 custodian or the steward of this precious character, uh, in order to keep to keep that joy alive for for children and uh, adults. Is just it's just such a it's a treasured treasured thing. 
And I will never take it for granted. Dr. Rock is such a wonderful, wonderful series for more and more today's generation of kids to enjoy Frog Walk as much as we do, we do growing up and see them, you know, watching their Frog Walk, you know, it's just, it's just absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a big shout out to the, the writers and the producers too, because they, they love the show as much as we all do. And I think, I don't know if everyone knows that, um, but it's, it's very true. And even the, you know, the, the, the executives at Apple too, they just love the show so much. There's, there's so much love there. Uh, and it's always a challenge to take something that people love and don't want to change, but it has to change if it's going to be, if it's going to resonate with kids today. So walking that line between Mm -hmm. keeping the magic of what it was and recreating some new magic, it's, um, it's very hard to do. And sometimes it's not successful, but I think they, the writers just really nailed it with this show. And it's, it's such, I just... (sighs) I'm over the moon. I can't believe that I'm on this show, honestly. Uh, yeah. Definitely. And um, recently, you also got to work with the uh, the Muppets troupe on the Muppets Mayhem. What was it like getting to work with them on that? You know, there's such... such a fun show. Yeah, the the atmosphere was just joyous. Um, those guys are just so so talented, and it was you know the coolest thing was getting to to work. Um, a lot with Dave Goals because we we were in the van one day riding up to a location and he says Donna we've done a whole series together but we've barely spent any time together I was like I know Dave Goals I know and uh he said so what's your life like like um um well (laughs) just I'm gonna throw my life uh in in one sentence for you uh but it was great really really uh fun especially getting to know Dave a little better because he's just, I just find him just hilarious just as a person. Um, But seeing the guys work together, see how loving and supportive and what the family that they are, uh, really, really special to see that. And getting to know some other puppeteers that I had just met on that show, like Bradley Freeman. um, That was a delight. And being, I had met David Bizarro already great to spend some time with dave b lanoil great to spend time with mm, um yes, seeing dave, stephanie love, love, leslie of uh, course stephanie, leslie yes it's amazing leslie name. ferrara so and mm-hmm. alice denine as skilled yep. as she is and she was yes. puppet co-captain so she would assign us you know alice. our things to do so so happy for her and peter yeah yes, yes. yeah that was so Yay. sweet to see them on, on hooray for love hooray for puppet love Yes. Um, and seeing Stephanie DeBruzzo in person and just what a consummate pro she is, just so prepared and just just really, really amazing. It was really wonderful to get spend a little extra time with her and get to know her better. Yes. Uh, so impressive. So absolutely. Yeah, really just fun. That was just yes. fun. Yes, Muppets Mayhem such a wonderful series. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I got to assist almost everyone at some point uh i was got to do hands for dr teeth sometimes got to do some bunnies in the background sometimes and um well i got to make janice play bass oh cool nice nice that that was really fun nice Floyd did a lot of floyd playing bass um yeah just wonderful that's cool yeah so i'm gonna go star got to be a drummer of one one of those songs Uh, too which that was really wonderful Yeah. yeah Wonderful. Really excited about that. that, that that's just wonderful. <laughs> yes. So, um, uh, before we're getting close to wrapping up very soon, um, uh, we uh, we want to uh, briefly mention uh, uh glorious ladies uh, puppetry. What was? What's what it, it like? What's yeah. like working on that? Because I know you're working on some uh, new projects with them. Yeah. We are. We're g- gonna start dropping our season two next week. Oh. January seventeenth. You heard it here first. Yes. Um, awesome. So yeah, this is our second season, and we created this during the pandemic because, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of work going on, and uh, we really just wanted to let our industry and the world know that there are tons of women puppeteers, and they're all really funny and ready to work, and that there's a ton of us, and um, that was really our goal. So the first season of glop we have 21 
women puppeteers and yeah. we've got um more this time because we've met more people people that we've taught and people that we've met along the way so uh yeah so six more episodes coming up and then our um galop 48 film festival is uh february 9th through the 11th so any aspiring uh filmmakers out there who see this before february 9th um please submit kids are especially encouraged uh, yeah so lots Awful. lots going on yes, yes. I, yeah. for that i gotta say i really enjoyed the fork tag you guys did that was <laughs> so fun to watch wasn't that a blast there was yes like, i think there were like uh, how many uh, 58 57 something like that it i mean was... that's amazing could you name yeah. 57 women puppeteers and we didn't even get to everyone yeah, I, I can't I can't name everybody, but yeah. quite quite a bit. It was just so fun watching how unique each one was, and it was, right. it was just really fun to watch. Yeah, yeah really we got the idea. Lot. We wanted to do a. We just wanted to get our number of followers up before we released our second season, so um, we decided to do a video a day. And then we thought, well, let's spread it out. Let's let you know. Let's, let's pass a prop that everyone has. And Colleen came up with the idea of a fork. Yes. So uh, I know, just silly, right? But they're yeah, so. And each one was so personal. I felt like, like yeah. you know, of course, of course, Leslie is gonna like run through the woods and have all of these shots. Hers was so so fun. And <laughs> she was like that was our first one that made everyone go wow. And then everyone tried to you know top each other after that. But mm. uh, yeah, that was that was so much more uh delightful than we thought it was going to be it just kept turning into its own thing and Absolutely. we had so many people reaching out to us and then so many people we would think oh what about this person what about this person but it was very loose and informal uh but yeah the fork tag was a blast i think we'll do that again sometime nice oh, yeah nice so to uh really wrap this up the last question that uh matt's going to ask here is the question we ask all of our guests at the end go ahead matt Thank you very much, Chris. This podcast is called Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. When you think of nostalgia, what do you think of? Or in your own words, how do you define the word nostalgia? I would define nostalgia as a, as a cozy memory. A memory oh, that is great. cozy and comfy and positive. And it's like an old blanket or shirt that you just want to snuggle back into so uh, cozy memory i would say is, a, is the concise for me definition of what nostalgia is yes great words to end on yes thank you you so, a lot thank you well donna <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to do this this was a blast thank you guys that was fun yes of course and um and thank you so much you know uh, for uh for what you've done over the years of puppetry wise and everything else you've done and thank and thank you for what you're doing and be a part of our worlds and, and keep up the great work of what you're doing now and can wait what's next in store for you we're very excited for season two yes, back to yes, walk it's, yes. it's we're very we're very looking yes. forward to it yes oh, it's so wonderful to, to share that uh that news to hear that news from you guys really, yes. really great. And I, I was wondering if in the future um once season two is out and about um i was wondering if you might be interested in maybe coming back to the podcast yeah sure. to talk about season two because i know uh john tartagli is coming back yes so, all right yeah. good maybe we could have the two of you on together or something who knows Ooh, sure that'd be cool we might well, donna, thanks again uh, hopefully I'm we can sure keep in, hopefully you can keep in touch uh somehow yeah absolutely yes, yes. yes. thanks so much you guys thank all you right. what would be what would be the best what would be the best way to keep in touch um well, you've got my my agent's contact info. All right. And right. you can you can DM me on social media. I get those okay. pretty quickly. Cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, okay. enjoy the rest of your day, Donna. Uh, keep in touch. I'll, I'll let your agent Thank know you. when this goes up. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, Sounds good. Pleasure. All right. All right. Thanks, Bye, guys. Donna. Take care. Well, bye. -bye. bye. Oh, absolute pleasure. Take care, Donna. Bye. Yes. It's goodbye from us as well, everybody. We absolutely enjoyed our time with the lovely Donna Kimball. Um, and we just talked about Glorious Ladies of Puppetry. Um, keep on lookout for uh, their upcoming projects, as well yes. as the, as of taping, just recently announced season two of Fraggle Rock. Back to yes. the Rock. Yes. Dropping exclusively on Apple TV Plus, March 29th. Um, yeah, send her but, social media and everything in the description down below so y'all can give a follow. Yes. Check out what she's doing. Yes. And everything. Absolutely. But it's goodbye from us as mm -hmm. well, as I just mentioned. Keep on the lookout for more wonderful interviews coming your way. And as always, what do we say, Jake? 
keep nostalgia alive. Take care, everyone. See you next time. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. This episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show is dedicated to the loving memory of Marty Croft, one half of the iconic duo of Sid and Marty Croft, who created such shows as The Banana Splits, H.R. Puff and Stuff, Land of the Lost, Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, and Mutton Stuff. Marty passed away on November 25th at the age of 86. His memory and legacy will live on in our hearts. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.